Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about the second part of the structure conduct performance paradigm, which is conduct. Conduct is a catch-all for the various behaviors and decisions that a firm can make. That includes pricing and how much they are marking up their final good, integration of various kinds, which is often accomplished through mergers, research and development, and finally, advertising. Pricing behavior is one of the parts of conduct that we will end up talking about the most. It's one of the most fundamental decisions that a firm can make. Observing different industries in the economy, we can notice that some firms charge higher markups than others. That's going to have a direct impact on the profitability of those industries. Even within an industry, we might see different markup for one firm versus another. All kinds of things affect a firm's ability to charge a higher markup, including the concentration of the industry. Usually more concentrated industries have higher markups, uh, as well as technology differences. Usually we think of a firm selecting a single price for a product and that being their one pricing decision. However, in certain circumstances, firms are able to use more advanced pricing strategies. We're going to be talking about those in a few weeks after we get the basics of market structure and oligopolies figured out. Mainly that's going to be different versions of price discrimination. The main way that we can measure and compare across different industries the ability to mark up product prices is with the learner index. The learner index is a measurement of the difference between the price and the marginal cost, essentially our markup, divided by the price. So what that gives us is a fraction of the price. Of course, we know that price needs to be at least as high as marginal cost. Otherwise, there's going to be no reason to actually produce this good. As such, the learner index is going to be a number between 0 and 1. Usually how this works is that highly competitive industries will have a lot of price competition. As firms compete for customers, prices get driven down. Of course, what's the lowest point at which prices can be driven down to? Marginal cost. In those cases, the learner index is going to be zero. When there's less vigorous price competition, prices tend to be above marginal cost, and then we're going to get a positive learner index. Of course, the only way for the learner index to get all the way up to one is if marginal cost is zero. Let's look at a few examples of learner indexes throughout a few different industries. Starting up here at the top, we've got food. It has a learner index of 0 0.26. That's a relatively low learner index, one of the lower ones on this chart. That suggests that the food industry is quite competitive on price. This also means that the profit margin tends to be relatively low on food. Compare that to the next one on the list, tobacco, which is the highest learner index on this list. That means that the profit margin for tobacco products tends to be quite high. This might be tied into some of the things we talked about in the last video about brand loyalty of cigarette smokers. If cigarette smokers are highly brand loyal, then that's going to reduce the competitiveness of the industry because each individual cigarette producer is less worried about losing its customers to another brand. Next, we'll talk about integration and mergers. When we say integration, broadly speaking, we mean that we are uniting productive resources. That's a very general way to say things because integration can come in three different flavors, vertical, horizontal, and conglomerate. Integration can generally happen in two different ways. Firms might be integrated from the very beginning and as part of their business model. Usually when firms are integrated from the beginning, we're talking about vertical integration. For example, a brew pub, which integrates the beer production and the beer selling portions of that industry. They're also usually going to throw in some food sales as well. Of course, the other way that integration can happen is when two existing independent firms merge into one. We already talked about vertical integration a bit back in chapter six when we were talking about reasons why firms might vertically integrate. There we talked about the idea that sometimes procuring inputs through spot markets and contracting is too difficult, so 
it ends up being easier to produce those inputs within the firm itself. Vertical integration is the unification of different steps of the production process into a single firm. For example, there's quite a bit of vertical integration that has happened in the automobile industry. Let's think about a few stages that exist in the automobile production. We've got the production of steel, that's a raw material. Then we have the building of all of the various parts of the car, including the body, the engine, mirrors, wheels, and so forth. Next we have assembly of the car, putting all those parts together into a working vehicle. And then the final step, the actual sale to the consumer. Different automakers have chosen to integrate different parts of this process. For example, General Motors, a few decades ago, purchased one of its body manufacturers called Fisher Body and, and integrated all of their operations right into GM. Another more recent example would be Tesla. While most auto companies rely on largely independent dealerships to sell their cars to the consumer, Tesla has integrated where they do not have independent dealerships, rather they have corporate stores. This would be a difference in how this integration came about as well as with the Fisher Body and GM example that happened through a merger, whereas Tesla was integrated from the very beginning. Whereas vertical integration is the unification of different steps along a production process, horizontal integration is the merging of very similar products into a single firm. Usually the biggest advantage for a horizontal merger is to get to economies of scale. Recall that economies of scale are cost savings from having a large amount of output. This can come about because the firm is able to eliminate redundant factors of production. For example, if two small firms merge, they are only going to have to pay one CEO. Cost reductions are always going to make society better off. But are horizontal mergers good for society overall? Well, actually, usually not. The reason for that is that the merger also reduces the number of firms. That's going to reduce the amount of competition in that industry and therefore increase the market power of the new bigger firm and possibly even the other firms who are left over not even involved in the merger. This is actually going to make society worse off than before. This is one of the many places in economics where from a government standpoint we have to think about costs versus benefits. There's a social cost to mergers, there's a social benefit to mergers. There's a social cost to mergers, and there might be a social benefit to mergers, though not always. It's the Federal Trade Commission's job to think about what those costs and benefits are to society. If the costs outweigh the benefits, then the FTC might move to block that merger. About 10 years ago, Delta Airlines and Northwest Airlines proposed to merge, and the FTC allowed it. The argument for allowing that merger was that market power was not really increasing because Delta and Northwest did not really have a lot of crossover in their markets. Delta based in the South, Northwest based in the Upper Midwest, there really wasn't a lot of crossover so the amount of market power increase was pretty minimal. On the other hand, more recently, the FTC actually blocked a merger between Crisco and Wesson who are the two largest producers of canola oil. The FTC argued here that if these two firms merged, a single firm would control the vast majority of the canola oil industry, meaning they would have a huge advantage in market power there. This merger was eventually abandoned due to the FTC's opposition. The last type of integration and mergers to talk about are conglomerate mergers. Vertical and horizontal mergers share the feature that the mergers are between related products and sometimes extremely closely related products, whereas conglomerate mergers are the opposite. This kind of merger combines the production of completely different product lines into a single firm. To be called a conglomerate merger, the products should not be related, whereas in a horizontal merger, they're effectively producing the same thing. The arguments for a conglomerate merger are a little bit less clear than with the other two. 
One of these might be that by diversifying its portfolio of products, this new larger firm is a little bit more stable. Sometimes demand can be cyclical. Sometimes one division will be doing better, one will be doing worse, and that firm can use the currently more successful one to prop up the others. Another argument for conglomerate mergers can happen when there's a limited supply of skilled management talent. Suppose we had two firms, one run by a highly skilled CEO and the second one run by a more mediocre CEO. If there is a sufficient skill gap between these two people, merging into a single firm that is run by just the highly skilled CEO could potentially make the firms better off overall. This new combined firm might be doing better than those two firms would separately, as the CEO talent is not diluted as much. A good example of conglomerate integration would be Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway owns a wide variety of different subsidiaries, including an insurance company, Geico, a fast food restaurant, Dairy Queen, a railroad company, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, jewelry company, Healtsburg Diamonds, and a clothing company, Fruit of the Loom. None of these things really have anything to do with each other, so we say that this is a conglomerate. Another interesting part of conduct of firms is the amount of research and development and innovative activity that's going on. Remember that in economics, technology is how we turn inputs into outputs. And if the technology is more efficient, that's going to lower the cost for firms. If one firm in a market has superior, more efficient technology, that's going to allow them to lower their costs below their competitors, and that's going to be an advantage. Possibly only a temporary advantage, but it's an advantage nonetheless. So R&D spending is another important decision for firms, and one that varies a lot between firms and between industries. Patent law is a very important part of the R&D decision because a patent enables a firm to capture the benefits of their innovation. If patents didn't exist, the incentive to innovate would be much lower because competitors could just copy the innovation and there really wouldn't be a lot of private value to innovating. Patents and R&D are considered extremely important in the pharmaceutical and semiconductor industries where firms are always trying to stay ahead of their competition. In pharmaceuticals, it's more about developing new products. In semiconductors, it's about becoming more efficient and developing lower cost chips and things like that. Advertising is another way that firms can compete with each other without changing the price. Advertising, of course, is important for some firms and in some industries and not in others. And so it's important to think about why that happens. Different products have different characteristics that might be more suited to one certain kind of advertising or another, or maybe not really suited to advertising at all. Firms advertise for two main reasons. One is to inform buyers. In the last video, we talked about how the demand for a good might depend on how available information is to the consumer, so how easy it is for them to shop around for the best price. Sometimes advertising can help fill that role by informing buyers that a sale is going on or to inform buyers that your firm has the lowest price. The other use for advertising is persuasion to convince the buyers that one product is better than another or more suited to them than another or simply to expand the whole product category something like got milk an important question from a managerial econ perspective is what is the optimal amount of advertising how much should our firms spend on advertising so there again we're going to do these cost benefit analysis Certain market structures that we'll talk about later on, as well as certain products, are more suited to advertising than others. So let's compare a few different industries and how much they tend to do R&D and how much they tend to advertise. Up here we've got a pharmaceutical company who does a huge amount of R&D. The patent races that exist in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, are a big reason for that. On the other hand, they don't tend to do quite as much advertising because they don't really need to. Once they get 
their patent, they effectively get a monopoly for a period of time on that good. You can see this is significantly higher than all of these other firms on the list, particularly going down here to Kellogg, a food company. There's really not a lot of R&D that they need to do. On the other hand, they are going to do a lot of advertising. What Kellogg needs to do is convince customers that their product is better than others. And with food, there's a huge amount of competition.